Hey, pastors, we know you love your clerical shirt because of what it means, but how does it feel? Under all those vestments, is it hot and sticky? Is it too tight, too loose, or just not comfortable? Wicking Vicar has the solution for you. The Performance Clerical Shirt, featuring four-way stretch to let you move and moisture-wicking fabric to keep you cool. Plus, it's machine washable and wrinkle-resistant. Visit wickingvicar.com and treat yourself to more stretch, more movement, and easy care. The Performance Clerical from wickingvicar.com. Wickingvicar.com. Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is, the mind of Christ. And to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to conform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of Faith. On today's show, we are continuing our series on the Augsburg Confession, today covering Article 26 on the Distinction of Meats. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of Bethlehem Evangelical Lutheran Congregation in Mason City, Iowa, and my companion confessor in conversation about this article today is Pastor Mark Squire. He is pastor of Emmanuel Evangelical Lutheran Church in St. Ansgar, Iowa. Pastor Squire, welcome to Concord Matters. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Yeah, great to have you here. And just to let our listeners know and also to give thanks where it's, it's credit. Uh, so we're in the same circuit. We're in the same yes. area. Mm-hmm. And KCMR Radio here in Mason City, Iowa, not affiliated with the LCMS at all, but they have very graciously loaned us one of their studios to record this so that we can yeah. be in the same room and do this together. So we just want to thank KCMR Radio here in Mason City for allowing us to do that and, and to have this more conversational feel then as we, uh, we talk about this article, which on some level it's like, okay, that's, that's great. Why is this a thing? You know, right. 500 years or so ago, 492 or whatever, right. we just celebrated uh, a few weeks back. But, you know, obviously an issue then in the Roman Catholic Church. You might still see bits of it here today, but not really a thing, especially in our American context, that will hit too much necessarily. But uh, we're going to talk about some of that and how, you know, maybe, well, not maybe, but obviously, as is the purpose of the show, this is still a confessional matter for us, and we can see bits of it here too. But to get us started, I think it's good to kind of get into some of that historical context because some people may not even be aware of what we're addressing here. Uh, It may just be so off their radar because it's just not something that we face too much here. So get us into some of the historical context here. Yeah, so as you mentioned, it it might seem like Article 26, the distinction of meats, is something like, well, what, (laughs) what are we even dealing with? How does this apply to us? But really, like you said, in that historical context, it wasn't just the distinction of meats alone, but it was a lot of these different ideas, these traditions, these teachings, that had to do with, it started a lot of times with some of what were properly called vocations at the time. And in the medieval church, a vocation properly understood was something that you did within the church. So you became a priest, you became a monk or a nun. And from there, the vows that some of these priests and these monks and nuns would take sort of morph into some of these traditions that then get encouraged and even required among lay people who want to live a holy life or lay people who eventually want to merit the satisfaction of sin. So they're earning grace by doing these things. Uh, So certainly something that more explicitly applied to Luther's time, the time of the confessors 500 years ago, but certainly something that still applies today, not only in the Christian church worldwide, but Also, among Lutherans, we still, of course, confess these things, but we still struggle with these things, just knowing that there's nothing, no tradition, no man-made law or ordinance that can somehow earn my forgiveness, or something that should be required that actually obscures either the law of God or the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we will come to see that the confessors are very clear that these traditions— that, again, started with the priests and the monks and the nuns that got passed down, are obscuring God's word. 
And so that's, that's where you start to get some of these traditions. But uh, something that's, that's really interesting with the historical context here, you have, and now for your listeners, they may know that after the Augsburg Confession, you had a Roman response called the Confutation, which article by article addressed what the confessors laid forth as their confession. And so even though it comes after, I think it's, it's enlightening to know how they responded to this article. And if you read through the confutation in this Article 26 rebuttal, what they said was, what they say regarding distinction of foods and other traditions, things for which they have little regard, must be rejected. So as one might expect, the Roman Church rejected the confession of Article 26, which we'll get to in a few moments. But the basis for the rejection is really what I wanted to point out, because I think it gives us insight into where the Roman theologians are coming from for all of these articles, and what they base their rejection on, most notably, is Romans 13.1, which has to do with God establishing authority in the realm of government. So God has established authorities, and what they're arguing essentially is that the Pope and the cardinals and the bishops, all of these people in the church are authorities established by God. Therefore, what they say should be followed. The problem, of course, is that you really start to run into some of these logical fallacies. So what they're saying essentially is, you know, they're begging the question. They're assuming that what they're commanding or encouraging is good in the first place, number one. Number two, their other argument that matches up with this is that they fall into this sort of slippery slope argument where they say, well, if people aren't going to listen to the bishops, if they're not going to listen to the theologians, if they're not going to listen to the pope, then everybody's going to forsake all authority and tradition. So it's, it's that slippery slope. If we start down this road now, then all authority is going to be thrown out. And it's really something that comes from a, a position of power and a position of fear instead of what God's Word actually says. And that's where, when we look at any of these articles, it's really important for us to realize that what we confess and what we understand comes from God's Word first and foremost, before anything else, before any man-made tradition, before any historical context. It's what does God's Word say? Yeah, and this really fits in well with this section of the Augsburg Confession then, too, in what you just laid out there of, you know, these are all the various abuses. And we've talked about on the show before how a lot of this, you know, these were really kind of the things that started the Augsburg Confession with the Torgau articles and so forth. And then when they kind of realized what it was going to be, uh, they backed up and, and gave all of the other previous articles that said, you know, this is where we are in alignment with the church. But now we're really getting to the meat of the things that we right. are in disagreement on. And this distinction of meats, these other human traditions fit in with what we've talked about in terms of the abuses of um, monastic vows and all those sorts of things. And so we see that good tie in there for sure. Um, one thing that I think we should probably just like put a pin on it too. When we're talking about the distinction of meats, what is that exactly? What is that Roman Catholic practice there? Yeah, so with the distinction of meats, there the traditions having to deal with with eating. So even today, you know, some of your listeners might be familiar with, for example, that Roman Catholic Christians should not eat meat on Fridays. They can eat fish, but they can't eat meat, or they shouldn't at least. Uh, other things having to do with fasting, for example, uh, these foods that are maybe unholy on one day or encouraged to be eaten or not eaten on one day or the other, in the same way that you have all these different traditions that Paul, in fact, touched on in a way in 1 Corinthians 8, for example, with the food that's been sacrificed to idols. So there's, there's a tie into the biblical witness here in the sense that uh, there is a practical, tangible issue in Corinth when it comes to what can I eat and what can I not eat. But there, you know, you see Paul talking in terms of what is real, what is not real, what causes offense, what doesn't. And with the Roman church in the medieval times, these different laws and traditions came up and became not what causes offense or not, but how am I actually making satisfaction for sins? How am I living a holier life, eating meat or not meat, eating meat on this day or not this day? And so that's kind of what this refers to. Well, and as you make that point there too, I always like to say, 
again, kind of our contemporary looking at this, you know, very few people actually talk about, you know, oh, well, I do this and that earns my forgiveness of right. God. You know, that, that would have been more the common thing at the time of the Reformation. But I do think that it is still present around today of this thinking of, you know, like that this makes me a better Christian right. or, you know, that God is happier with me when I live in these. And as we'll talk about here, some of these things may be, as you already kind of alluded to, some of these may be fine, pious things sure. for you to do. I mean, um, you know, I actually don't even like fish, but I, <laughs> I try to in the piety of at least in the season of Lent, you know, and, and there's something to be learned and gained by that. And we can talk right. about all those sorts of things. But yeah, like, you know, if you somehow make that, think that that makes you a better Christian because you do yeah. that or something. So it's a similar kind of thinking there. Yeah. Right. Let's go ahead and get into the article here. So this is Article 26 on the Distinction of Meats from the Augsburg Confession. And of course, on this show, we read from Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord, available to you from Concordia Publishing House, the publishing arm of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And uh, as we've seen here in these abuse articles, as these are kind of the <laughs> meat, if you will, <laughs> of the Lutheran Reformation issues, they're obviously a little longer. And so earlier in the Augsburg Confession, we just read the entirety of the article and then discuss kind of the broad theology of it. But here we're going to just have to break it up because I, I don't think anybody wants to sit and listen <laughs> to the monotony of my voice reading a long <laughs> article here. You have audiobooks for that purpose, but we'll break it up here. And so I'll take just the first few lines here and then uh, discuss some things here. So not only the people, but also those teaching in the churches have generally been persuaded to believe in making distinction between meats and similar human traditions. They believe these are useful works for meriting grace and are able to make satisfaction for sins. From this, there developed the view that new ceremonies, new orders, new holy days, and new fastings were instituted daily. Teachers in the church required these works as a necessary service to merit grace. They greatly terrified people's consciences when they left any of those things out. Because of this viewpoint, the church has suffered great damage. All right, thus far, Article 26 on the distinction of meats from the Augsburg Confession. All right, Pastor Squire, get us into, as they set this article up here, what we're covering in these first three lines or so here. Yeah, and as I mentioned before, this article is titled The Distinction of Meats, but as the confessors have already laid out, this is not just about food, but it's about any ceremony, any order, any tradition that's been set out by the church for the express purpose of meriting grace. So something that became necessary, whether this was a teacher of the church, whether this was someone in one of those holy vocations, holy orders, or whether it was a regular lay person, any tradition, any law coming from the Pope or anyone else that was given to merit grace. And so you have some of these examples here. They say new ceremonies, new orders, new holy days, new fastings were instituted daily, which is kind of this hyperbolic way of saying all of these things were coming there are so many, you can't even keep track of them. It's such an overwhelming burden. And as we get farther into this article, we're going to see that burden really is a good word, something that's been laid on people's shoulders that actually harms their consciences. And as line three said, the church has suffered great damage. One of the, the interesting things about this first paragraph here, these first few lines, is that what the confessors are doing really and simply is echoing what Paul himself says in Galatians chapter 4. And he even uses some of the same language. Now, the problem at the church of the Galatians was, well, there are many problems there, like in Corinth, and one of the main reasons, or one of the main problems was circumcision, whether or not you had to be circumcised or follow the various laws of Moses to be a Christian. But it's here in chapter 4 that he really speaks again in this similar way to the confessors. And I'll just read a few verses here. So chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, Paul says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years, I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. A strong words from Paul there that I, I, I fear I may have labored over you in vain. 
And as we've seen throughout Galatians, if you read through Galatians, only six chapters long, you see over and over that Paul's concern is for the gospel. And that's exactly what this article of the Augsburg Confession is about. It is one of these abuses, these tangible, physical, everyday abuses that are really obscuring the gospel. And what Paul does here is he goes so far as to say that these are things you did formerly, so whether it's observing days, months, seasons, years, or any of these other traditions, or even the law of Moses, but this is when you did not know God. So what he's doing is connecting these, uh, for us here in Article 26, these man-made traditions, you're connecting these with idolatry. What these people are doing is not fearing, loving, and trusting in God above all things. They're trusting in their own works, their own traditions. They fear the bishops and the pope and the priests before they fear God, and they're loving you know, whatever it is they're doing. So God is not their God, properly speaking, but these traditions, and I think Paul brings that out very clearly. Um, James also, so Paul's not the only one, of course, in the New Testament, but you have James who speaks on this as well. Uh, you had here in the confessions that, that teachers in the church required these works. And what's really damning here, I think, in these words, sort of implied in this, is what James says here in chapter 3, verse 1. He says in his letter, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So not only is the problem that the gospel is being obscured, but that people who are teachers in the church, people who have rightly been placed in authority by God, are actually leading people astray to the result that people's consciences are terrified. And again, the church has suffered great damage, which brings us then to what our Lord Jesus Christ himself said about the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, the the Sadducees, the leaders who were doing this, this same thing in the time of Jesus. And what Jesus says is one of his strongest rebukes in the entire gospel. He says, for example, in Matthew 18, verse 6, that whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. In other words, that again, not only is it the teaching itself, the tradition that is a problem, but the fact that people in authority are passing this off as required for your salvation, for your forgiveness, adds a whole new level of judgment and condemnation to those who are pushing it. Yeah, there's a way in which, as I think about this, I I often think of, you know, of course, the Old Testament, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, right? You know, that a lot of what you see at the time of Jesus with the Pharisees and the things that gets Jesus so worked up of these man-made laws and traditions that, you know, as if that makes them good Jews and those sorts of things, right? You know, that's very much what's going on here at the time of the Reformation and I should also correct myself here. Monastic vows comes next, so that's that's coming up. Uh, I said that earlier. You know what we've been talking about, but we did talk about the marriage of priests and and some of those other things. And then we get to this article that's kind of this catch-all. But I, I think it's interesting that again, it's it's new ceremonies, new orders, new holy days, new fastings. You know, I think it's interesting that new is emphasized with yeah. each of those, and that's basically what you see play out with Jesus and the Pharisees, and and I think we'll still face in our own day and age too of again like how do we find ourselves how do we find our identity in a comfort of salvation ultimately is what it boils down to for the Jews and especially at the time of Jesus it was in the doing of these works right and mm-hmm. certainly at the time of the reformation and still today and then you kind of have that tension of you know again we should worry about like how am i saved right i mean we should think about that but we have to only find our comfort in the gospel and then you know so it's bad enough when you have the people you know kind of trying to find this but then the teachers who should apply the salve of the gospel to that right. are trying well, well you really need to do this you yeah. know like you know <laughs> pastor squire you really need to be on my radio show you know right. that's how i got you on here right exactly. i just applied yeah. the pressure and the circuit i have the I indulgence said, in my hand right? yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean it's shame on the teachers that right. you know kind of play into this and it's often for self-serving reasons and, and we still see that at work here in the church right. today right yeah the self-serving reasons oftentimes for them being 
the money to pay for whether it's St. Peter's or something else or, you know, the power and authority that comes with being in these positions to have say over people's everyday lives that is not a God-given authority. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Let's push forward then and get into the next several lines here, picking over verse four, because I think this, this hits it exactly on the head here, right? Of we should find that answer in the gospel. And it, it gets right into it immediately here. So this is picking up with line four of Article 26 on the distinction of meats from the Augsburg Confession. First, the chief part of the gospel, the doctrine of grace and of the righteousness of faith, has been obscured by this view. The gospel should stand out as the most prominent teaching in the church in order that Christ's merit may be well known and faith, which believes that sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, be exalted far above works. Therefore, Paul also lays the greatest stress on this article, putting aside the law in human traditions in order to show that Christian righteousness is something other than such works. And they cite Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Christian righteousness is the faith that believes that sins are freely forgiven for Christ's sake. But this doctrine of Paul has been almost completely smothered by traditions, which have produced the opinion that we must merit grace and righteousness by making distinctions in meats and similar services. When repentance was taught, there was no mention made of faith. Only works of satisfaction were set forth, and so repentance seemed to stand entirely on these works. All right, thus far, Article 26 on the distinction of meats from the Augsburg Confession. So I comment on this probably every week, but there's just several things that jump out at me as you go through the Augsburg Confession, just how often... It's kind of like the Lutheran move, right? Like, okay, you're not actually teaching the gospel. You're obscuring the grace of Christ. That's why we're so upset about this. And so uh, this is their first point. And I stopped right before they make their second point. So we'll pick up there um, Mm -hmm. probably after the break at this point as we have about uh, eight minutes or so here. But uh, get us into their first point here too. and, And the Lutheran move of focusing on the gospel. Well, that's exactly right. You have, and you mentioned some of these here, you study, you know, the worship of saints, communing in one kind, clergy celibacy, sacrifice of the mass, confession, monastic vows, all of these things have in common here at the end of the Augsburg Confession, the fact that, and the very important fact, that the the gospel has been obscured. And really, they have in mind here, I think, the gospel in the narrow sense, that is to say, the forgiveness of sins given by grace through faith. But this is true also, I think, for the gospel in the broad sense, that is to say, everything that Jesus came to do and say is being obscured by these traditions of men. So in other words, the traditions, the commands that are being given by the Pope, by the church, are actually taking away from who the Lord Jesus is, what he did, and what he's said. So even when it comes to Jesus giving commands to love one another and all of these sorts of things throughout the Gospels, all of it is being obscured. And it's something that, as you said earlier, Pastor Smith, is something that's not new. It's something that goes back all the way to the time of Paul. I mean, Paul, even just, what, a couple decades maybe after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, you have people who are trying to preach another gospel, which he says is no gospel at all. And so again, I just want to read a a short portion of Galatians, this time from chapter 1, starting at verse 6. (laughs) Paul—you love Galatians because Paul here doesn't have an extended greeting. He gets right into it, and I I just love how he starts here in verse 6. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who has called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, Let him be accursed. So this is, like you say, the Lutheran move. That is to say, this central doctrine to Lutheran teaching and practice is that God has forgiven our sins and saved us through the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. That this is centered in Jesus Christ, it is found in Jesus Christ, and it is freely given on account of God's grace not because of works, not because of traditions, not because of anything else. 
And so here in Article 26, it's the same issue. Something is being taught as meriting satisfaction for sins, and that obscures the gospel. So the Lutheran move then is to say, this is wrong. Now, on the contrary, right, the gospel should be the most prominent teaching in the church. Again, whether you're speaking of the gospel in a narrow or broad sense, the gospel of Jesus Christ, everything about Christ should be front and center in the church. What else do we have to give people other than Jesus, right? Jesus alone. And so Paul, again, to use a different one of his letters, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, he says here very clearly, starting at verse 23, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So whether you connect the, the medieval Catholics with the Jews or the Greeks here doesn't really matter, or some other category altogether, it's the fact that they weren't preaching Christ crucified, but instead something else. And here that would be the traditions of men. Yeah, I like the use of Galatians 1 here to really emphasize this point that, you know, how does he start that? I am astonished, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and that's part of that Lutheran move too, you know, and, and I, I hear this from folks at times where they're like, you know, oh, you Lutherans, you're just so, you just want to get worked up about what everybody else is doing wrong or something like that. <laughs> and it's like, well, but like, this is a very serious matter, right. right? I mean, just coming over to the studio here again, KCMR, thank you so much for letting us use your studio. Uh, but as we were coming over, we saw another church here in Mason City, just down the road here. And, uh, you know, they're, they're flying the rainbow flag and those sorts of, and, th- and that's what's being taught there. And it's like, you know, we're astonished at that. And we talked about that and so forth. And why are we astonished about that? You know, not because like we just have like an ax to grind of, against homosexuality or those sorts of things. But like, if that's what's being taught in that church, you are obscuring the one thing that, the one thing that saves, which is Jesus Christ for right. the forgiveness of sins. And then, you know, tying in again with that quote that you brought in from Matthew 18 so well from Jesus, you know, like whoever causes one of these little ones to fall, I mean, it's it's better that you have a millstone hung around your neck and drown in the depths yeah. of sea because not only are they wandering lost from the only thing that saves them, but then you are misdirecting them. And so that's why we get worked up about these things. That's why Luther was so worked up. That's why the Lutheran reformers and confessors were so worked up. And that's why we still do today. And, you know, yeah, we shouldn't do that in mean ways or aggressive sure. ways and so forth. But, I mean, this is a very serious thing. Yeah. And it, it might seem like the opposite problem, but it's really the same problem that's just the other side of the same coin. So instead of, on the one hand, in medieval Catholicism, you have the hierarchy that is requiring certain things to make satisfaction. On the other hand, here now in our current cultural context, you have people that are essentially saying, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, just live how you want, and God will love you anyway. And so that, even though it sounds different, is actually just kind of the same problem, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself is being obscured. Uh, just one minute here before break, and I want to pick up with their second point here on the other side of break, but get us into what they're talking about here with repentance and being divorced from faith and so forth. Yeah, the line again was when repentance was taught, there was no mention made of faith. And their point here really is that repentance, of course, and we would agree with them, means that our lives are going to look differently. You are literally turning away from sin, turning away from your idols toward God, and we would agree on that. The problem here is that they're making the works themselves what saves and not any mention of faith in Jesus Christ, uh, the grace of God, any of that. And so actually a good illustration of this happens at the end of the Gospels where you have Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus in this awful way who feels contrition, and we see him maybe you can say trying to repent. I don't, I, I don't know if that's the best way to say it, but he is wanting to return the money and trying to figure out what to do to make this right or make his, uh, assuage his guilt or something like that. But he goes to the leaders and what do they say? Instead of giving, like you said, Pastor Smith, that healing salve of the gospel, they say, what does this have to do with us, right? So Judas goes away feeling contrite and guilty, but has no faith. And this is the difference between Judas and Peter. They both make terrible errors, but Judas, on the one hand, goes and hangs himself because he has no faith. But Peter, who is still feeling guilty, sticks around, and he's able to see 
and experience the forgiveness of Jesus Christ through that faith. And so repentance or actions or however you want to say it, apart from faith, whether it's man-made or not, isn't going to lead you to salvation. Yeah. And I think that relates, you know, as we just came out of the article on confession and the abuse there, right? Uh, I think that relates in really well with this point. And it's going to tie into their second point, which we'll pick up on the other side of the break here of really, you're not even doing the law right. right? right. And so uh, we'll pick that up on the other side of the break with our guest today, Pastor Mark Squire. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, and you're listening to Concord Matters on KFUO. The word of Christ comes forth from his mouth as a sharp, two-edged sword. By that word, he puts our sin to death, and he raises us to new life in him. Join me, Pastor Timothy Apple, on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on KFUO, as guest pastors from around the world lead us into the Word of God to help us sharpen our faith in Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. And welcome back to Concord Matters as we continue looking at the Augsburg Confession, Article 26 on the distinction of meats here today with our guest, Pastor Mark Squire. He is pastor of Emanuel Evangelical Lutheran Church in St. Ansgar, Iowa. And Pastor Squire, as we set up there just before the break, you know, you have the gospel obscured. And we talked about, you know, that this is kind of the Lutheran move. Obviously, one of the other Lutheran things that I bring up all the time, because my hero is C.F.W. Walther, and the proper distinction of law and gospel, these things uh, matter to us as Lutherans. They're they're important to Scripture, obviously, too. But uh, I think that's where they go next here. Uh, So I'm going to pick up reading with line eight with their second point of kind of why this is an abuse in the church. And so, again, this is picking up with line eight of Article 26 on the distinction of meats from the Augsburg Confession. Second, these traditions have hindered God's commandments because traditions were placed far above God's commandments. Christianity was thought to stand wholly on the observance of certain holy days, rites, fasts, and vestments. These observances won the exalted title of the spiritual life and the perfect life. Meanwhile, God's commandments, according to each one's vocation or calling, were without honor. These works include a father raising his children a mother bearing children, a prince governing the commonwealth. These were considered to be worldly and thus imperfect works far below the glittering observances of the church. This error greatly tormented people with devout consciences. They grieved that they were held in an imperfect state of life as in marriage, in the office of ruler, or in the other civil services. They admired the monks and others like them. They falsely thought that these people's observances were more acceptable to God. All right, thus far, Article 26 of the Augsburg Confession. All right, so their second point here is when you direct them towards the law and what they do to find their assurance that they're worthy before God, and and especially, you know, the more common language would be worthy of salvation, you know, at the time of the Reformation. Again, maybe we don't talk those ways, and maybe unhealthily so we don't talk those ways uh, this day, but it, it is what it boils down to, whether you look at, you know, what assurance do I have that I'm a good Christian, or whatever way you talk about it, it boils down to the same thing. And we saw this again with confession, but also with the marriage of priests and things like that, that when you direct them towards the law, but they're not, it's not actually doing the law right, right. you know? And so, so, yeah, get us into this here. Yeah, and I think that's the important point here is that they're not doing the law right. That is to say, you know, you and I, with our circuit, we studied Luke chapter 10 earlier, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and the lawyer or scribe or whatever you want to call him comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus doesn't say, well, nothing. No, he says, well, what is it, what is written? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, do this and you will live. That is to say, God gives us good commands, commands that are good for us and good for our neighbors. The people here in medieval Roman Catholicism are placing human traditions and burdens on the people that have nothing to do with God's will. It would be more comparable than to when Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and the leaders about 
how God says, honor your father and mother, but you, you know, you're going to give your gift to the temple and then say, oh, well, everything else is Corbin and I'm not going to help my parents when they're in need, right? So they've set up their own sort of spiritual life or perfect life, as the confessors call it here, this sort of sarcastic, like, yeah, you think you're really holy and perfect and spiritual, but if you just listen to what God's will was in the law, you would be so much better off. So not only are these traditions obscuring the freedom of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins, but they're obscuring also God's very words, which when you look throughout the scripture, of course, in the history of God's people, God's word is life. It's something that we are supposed to value and love and meditate on, which we see in the very first psalm. So Psalm 1, for example, you have the psalms beginning with, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And then this is the Mark Squire translation here. But but his delight is in the instruction of Yahweh, and on his instruction he will meditate day and night. So not just the law as in do this or don't do this, but everything that God has said. It's that Torah, it's that instruction, the teaching of God. Uh, and you, you have the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, all 176 verses as an acrostic poem on loving God's law. So God's law is a good thing, and and we as Lutherans confess this, and we should talk like this because it's God's will. Instead, the medievals had set up these two classes of life, these perfect works and these imperfect or less spiritual types of living. But when you look at the table of duties, for example, you have your listeners look near the back of the small catechism, to citizens, to mothers and fathers, to parents and to children, to rulers. Everybody has their good word from God about how they should live. And yet these traditions are obscuring even the simple everyday things. Luther loves to talk about changing the diapers of children. This is a holy work. It's not going to the monastery and praying the seven offices of the day. It's not doing any of these other things with distinguishing meats or observing days and seasons. It's loving the neighbor that God has put in your life. And so that's what the confessors are saying here, that this is an error then which greatly torments the consciences of devout people. So people looked up to the monks, they looked up to the priests, and they tried to do these things, but instead they were tormented. And Jesus has a word for this. So again, in Matthew chapter 23, Uh, Starting at verse 4, Jesus says about the scribes and the Pharisees that they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. And I think this is true even for the medieval monks and priests that they set up these traditions, but how did the Pope live? You know, how did these monks live? And they often would live really in luxury, or the the ones that had, had vowed celibacy, they were off, as Luther said, you know, they were often in these prostitutes' houses. They, you know, Luther comes back from Rome and says that, you know, there's, there's prostitutes' houses just for the priests, right? You know? So they're not even living like the burdens that they're putting on people, and yet what they're doing is terrifying consciences. Yeah, and it is so disturbing when you see this play out because, again, where does your assurance come that right. you are— Actually, I mean, this This is the whole reason for the proper distinction of law and gospel, right? Yeah. Is that if you don't get the law right, you know, then it obscures the gospel. Right. And if you're not directing towards the salve of the gospel, then you're not doing the law right. I mean, that's basically, uh, you know, a gross oversimplified, of course, the, you know, Luther and that CFW Walther echoes him, you know, to properly distinguish law and gospel is a fine art, you know, worthy right. of a doctor of the church. And so, you know, it's a lot higher than that too. But, you know, my Sean Smith paraphrase version of what's going on here, right, is that Yeah, basically, you're messing both up by confusing these things, which is always what happens when you don't have that proper distinction there. And to jump to a contemporary application here, too, one of the things that we still see today is that, you know, you'll you'll have devout people that want to serve the church and they want to do good things and so forth. And they feel this pressure. And, And sometimes it's subtly taught in some churches or just even modeled in some churches. Sometimes it's outright pushed in them, you know. I don't necessarily see that in the LCMS, uh, the outright kind of thing. But, you know, sometimes the subtle things even works in here, too. And I've seen this where, like, you know, you have really devout folks that get really involved in wanting to do overseas mercy missions and being on the board of elders and serving on the trustees and just doing all of these things, you know, 
And these are important things that are good things, and we certainly want to encourage, you know, we need these things for the functioning of the church and so forth. I'm not saying don't do these things, but I, I've even seen it promoted by some people where they say, oh, isn't so-and-so just such a great Christian? Right, Look at all right. that they do and everything. And I've seen so many instances where I look at that with somewhat a skeptical eye and I say, yeah, but, you know, like, look at their family. I mean, their children don't even know the gospel. Yeah. Like, are they doing devotions in the home? Like, is there any time for anything when you're doing all of this and you're, you're looking for your comfort and assurance there that, like, basically what it boils down to is you're obscuring the more holy things right. that God has given you in his word. Like, you want to be a great Christian? It may not receive the praise of the world or even your, your fellow Christians, although we should praise these things. But just be a good father and mother and raise your children in the faith and Mm -hmm. do these things that we so easily gloss over, but are actually the better things. And they are because God himself has given it to us as his instruction for this is the way to live. That's doing the law rightly, right? Yeah. Well, now, you know, to go back to the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite who go by the man who's traveling on the other side of the road, they might be off going to do holy things, you know, they might going to fulfill their priestly duties or their Levitical duties in some way. And yet they miss the fact that God has put literally in their road, in their way, somebody, a neighbor that needs to be loved, right? So like you said, the things that we might think, oh, well, we're going to help the world, we're going to save the world, but am I even loving my children? Am I even loving my neighbors that are right here in front of me? And that's what these traditions do. They set up this holy life but instead they're obscuring the love that I can give to my neighbor that God actually wants me to do right now. Yeah. And again, some of these things too, like fasting and so forth, there's, there's fine spiritual yeah. training that can happen and, and you can teach that to your children. And, yeah. you know, again, we, you know, my children are still quite young and everything. And so their comprehension of these things, but like, you know, we already try to encourage the understanding of some of these things, but if that ever gets to the point where, you know, it just obscures you know, the fact that they are a child of God saved by his grace. And so, right. well, then we're, we're doing something wrong. Let's yeah. get back to the basics here, right? And again, not, and I bring up the example of like, you know, those who are looked at as being such great Christians. That's not to beat them up either and sure. say that they're not. I mean, I think a lot of times they are very devout and they desire to be faithful. But that's why, especially you and I as teachers in the church, as pastors, need to make clear and really teach our people about these things well right. uh, so that they would be directed to these things. Again, because I think it just is there so subtly so many times because it comes from our culture that it's the things that you do yeah. that make you a good person, right? You know, mm-hmm. our, even our secular culture thinks that way. And so, you know, if we don't have good, clear teaching and direction on these things, with a right distinguishing of these things, then, yeah, you just get it obscured for yeah. them and, and misdirected. All right, let's pick up with their third point here. Uh, so this is picking up with line 12 of Article 26 of the Distinction of Meats from the Augsburg Confession. Third, traditions brought great danger to consciences. It was impossible to keep all traditions, and yet people considered these observances to be necessary acts of worship. Gerson writes that many fell into despair and that some even took their own lives because they felt that they were not able to satisfy the traditions. All the while, they had never heard about the consoling righteousness of faith and grace. We see that the academics and theologians gather the traditions and seek ways to relieve and ease consciences. They do not free consciences enough, but sometimes entangle them even more. The schools and sermons have been so occupied with gathering these traditions that they do not even have enough leisure time to touch on scripture. They do not pursue the far more useful doctrine of faith, the cross, hope, the dignity of secular affairs, and consolation for severely tested consciences. Therefore, Gerson and some other theologians have complained sadly that because of all this striving after traditions, they were prevented from giving attention to a better kind of doctrine. Augustine forbids that people's consciences should be burdened. He prudently advises Geranius that he must know that they are to be observed as things neither commanded by God nor forbidden, for such are his words. All right, thus far, Article 26 on the distinction of meats from the Oxford Confession. All right, so in this third point here, once again, this is one of the things that I feel like I 
am highlighting every week as we go through the Augsburg Confession that the emphasis on the burden conscience and how it is consoled, and that's closely related to that other thing that I keep emphasizing, which is, you know, the gospel is obscured by this, and so there is no consolation here. And they really hit that quite hard here in this, you know, this is the danger, it's the danger to the conscience. So get us into this paragraph here. Yeah, the first point here under the third section is that it is impossible to keep all traditions. And this is what, in part, in large part, brings about these burdened consciences and the damage to the church, because we already know as Lutherans that the law of God is impossible to keep. And even if by some miraculous gift, one man were able to perfectly keep the law, you'd still have the problem of being born a sinner, an enemy of God, right? So if if God's law, you know, if we are, are sinners by nature, if God's law is impossible to keep, even though God wants us to, how much more than all of the extra stuff that we come up with, all of these traditions that might seem good, but really what they're doing is they're just burdening us further to the point where where should we turn? I can't do this. I can't keep up all of these things. I can't even keep the day straight for when I'm supposed to eat meat or when I'm supposed to fast or be at mass or do whatever. So that's this first part here is that these traditions are simply impossible to keep. And because of that, he says, many fall into despair. Now, I had to look this up. I didn't know who Gerson was, but John Gerson apparently was a French theologian from the 14th century. He was at the University of Paris. And this is all to say that the confessors here in the 1500s are not the first people to recognize a problem, not even close. There are people hundreds of years before who recognize the abuses and the despair that comes about because of these traditions. And so what the confessors here are saying is that we're not the first. This has been a problem for a long time. And you can see throughout the church the problems that these things have caused. So consciences, he says, they're so tormented that even some are taking their lives, which, you know, to go to our contemporary culture, this is one main reason why a person might take his life is because of the guilt and despair of not having done enough or doing something wrong. You think that there's no salvation because I can never make up for what I've done or what I haven't done. This is what despair leads to, you know, not necessarily to dwell on Judas again, but there you see it. How am I going to be saved? Judas is probably thinking, the priests have no care for me. Jesus isn't going to take me back in, so this is my only option, right? So it's it's bad. People are dying because of this. Now, the other part of this, too, that I think is really important, that it's down in line 15, and I thought this was really quite an indictment both on the Christians of the time of the Reformation, but also on us today. They said they do not even have enough leisure time to touch on the scriptures. So again, to go back to the traditions obscuring God's word, what time do we even have to be in God's life-giving word if we're worried about distinguishing meats, fasting, doing all of these, quote, holy things? And this is where, when we start thinking again about the catechism, about God's commands, you think about the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Well, this isn't about worshiping on Saturday, right, the Sabbath day, or even about some new Sabbath like Sunday. But what do we say that this means? We say that this means that we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. And that's important, number one, because God's word is life-giving, Right? We hear the gospel, the forgiveness of sins from the word. We hear what God's will is when we hear his word. But also, and this is just such a comforting verse in every time of life, Jesus says very clearly in Matthew 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So how can we come to Jesus apart from his word? We can't, right? We can't find Jesus wherever we want to find him. We find him where he said he's going to be. And so this is actually uh, verse 30 here. The the last one is a verse that Augustine quotes with this letter to Januarius, or however you say his name, that he shouldn't be burdened by any of these sort of traditions, but instead should find comfort in Jesus and in his word. This is where we find true Sabbath rest, And you see this throughout Hebrews, for example, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, 
This is the true Sabbath rest. It's in Christ. It's in his word and not in accomplishing traditions or commands. Yeah, and as you mentioned there, too, that people are losing their life over this. Uh, I think I brought up on the show back when we went through the formula of Concord. This is where I've seen what tends to happen today, and it comes out of more Reformed thinking than Roman Catholic thinking of this doctrine of election, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, this is basically what it boils down to is, you know, how do I have assurance of my salvation? How do I know that God will receive me into his eternal kingdom? Well, the reform teaching on the doctrine of election is very similar to the Roman Catholic. Like it's yeah. it's in the things that you do, the things that we right. can see, right? And and so it takes on a slightly different form, obviously, than it does for the Roman Catholics. But it, it's essentially the same thing. And I I have known people that have tried to commit suicide, and and some that have taken their lives by suicide, just simply because they're so burdened by this. Yeah. You know they we get beat up by the world and we can never do enough. Try as we might. Parents, it's most obvious, right? You know, like you're trying, you're trying, you try to do the best for your kids. You you think about it all the time. It keeps you up at night. And then, you know, you just get punched in the face, right? It's just like, hey, I just can't do it. I can't get enough done, right? Uh, Right. and, And we strive after these things. And so if I'm looking for my assurance of being in the favor of God and, and, you know, a good Christian, you know, and those sorts of things and doing things rightly, if I'm looking to that for my assurance, there is no hope for me. And that's what leads to suicide all the time, right? Yeah. Is th- there's just no hope because right. you don't have hope in this world. I mean, I certainly don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and when you feel beat up by this world, if you don't have the hope of eternal life and the assurance by God's grace, yeah, you do. You just get overcome by despair yeah. here. All right, uh, 10 minutes or so here, so uh, we're going to push forward. Lots to cover, as is usually the case for me. We may have to rush through or maybe not get it all, but uh, at least push forward here a little bit and pick up with line 18 of Article 26, the distinction of meats. Therefore, our teachers must not be regarded as having taken up this matter rashly or from hatred of the bishops or some falsely suspect. There was a great need to warn the churches of these errors that arose from misunderstanding the traditions. The gospel compels us to insist on the doctrine of grace and the righteousness of faith in the churches. This cannot be understood if people think that they merit grace by observances of their own choice. All right, we'll just pause there for a second. I don't know if there's a lot to say. We've kind of addressed this some already. But yeah, it's not that we just are upset with them and want to be upset, but that these errors are really dangerous. Yeah. Well, that's the thing we don't, as Lutherans, we don't want to get rid of stuff to get rid of stuff. The stuff that's dangerous, the stuff that's deadly, that's the stuff we want to get rid of. So tradition is good, but if it's man-made tradition that's obscuring the gospel and the word of God, you know, let it be gone. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Let's pick up with line 21. So our churches have taught that we cannot merit grace or be justified by observing human traditions. We must not think that such observances are necessary acts of worship. Here we add testimonies of scripture. Christ defends the apostles who had not observed the usual tradition, and that's in Matthew 15, 3. This had to do with a matter that was not unlawful, but rather neither commanded or forbidden. It was similar to the purifications of the law. He said in Matthew 15, verse 9, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Therefore, he does not require a useless human service. Shortly after, he adds, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. And that's a quote from Matthew 15, verse 11. So also Paul in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And in Colossians 2, verse 16, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a Sabbath. And again, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. That's Colossians 2, 20 through 21. Peter says, Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And that's a quote from Acts fifteen ten to 11. Here, Peter forbids burdening consciences with many rights, either from Moses or others. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul calls the prohibition of meats a teaching of demons. 
It is contrary to the gospel to introduce or to do such works thinking that we merit grace through them, or as though Christianity could not exist without such service of God. All right, we'll pause there thus far. Article 26 on the distinction of meats from the Augsburg Confession. All right, a lot of scripture passages just laying it out here, and I I love that last one there. Paul calls this (laughs) a teaching of demons, right? Right. I mean, that's just really strong point there. Yeah, and it's a teaching of demons because— it is obscuring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so any spirit that says Jesus is Lord and Jesus has been raised, it's from God. But anyone anyone that obscures that is, it's a demon, right? It's not from God. And so you have Paul's very clear and strong language about this. And also back, you know, in Matthew, you had Jesus language too about worshiping in vain. So traditions are fine, but what they're doing is replacing the commandments of God with their traditions, which really is it's the height of hubris and, and idolatry, right? You're replacing something of God with something that you've made. So this becomes sort of that playing out of the knowledge of good and evil apart from God's word. I want to know what's good and evil on my own. I'm going to set it up. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to be like God. Now that's idolatry. And so you have that connected naturally with demons. For the sake of time here, I'm not going to read the next section here it's from like line 30 to 39 here, but I'll let you kind of pull out some points here for us and uh, get us into what they cover there. Yeah, so in this section, uh, right before their summary, then what they're doing is again teaching that traditions can be good. There's a benefit to beneficial traditions, so traditions that aren't obscuring God's word, aren't bringing us to despair. So, for example, understood correctly, fasting, like you said earlier, Pastor Smith, is good. We have that in the Catechism. We confess in the section on the Lord's Supper that fasting and bodily preparation are indeed good outward training. It's a good thing that we should do, and probably as Lutherans need to talk about and do more. But these things have to do with disciplining the body. They have to do with self-control. So I know there's any number of passages we could look at, but one in particular, Hebrews chapter 12, the author writes, At the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And that's what tradition should be. They should be beneficial to us in that we are disciplining our bodies for the purpose of righteousness so that we can resist temptation and not fall into these traps of the world. Yeah, I always like to talk just with the issue of fasting, you know, it teaches me that my belly is not my God, right. you know, yeah. which is a real struggle for me because <laughs> <laughs> I, I love to eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> but Join yeah. the club. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, beneficial. Yeah. Uh, let's push forward here. Just a couple minutes left. I'll read kind of their summary here and then let you have your parting thoughts and kind of wrap things up for us here today. So picking up with line 40. Nevertheless, we keep many traditions that are leading to good order. And they cite 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. In the church, such as order of scripture lessons in the mass and the chief holy days. At the same time, we warn people that such observances do not justify us before God and that it is not sinful if we omit such things without causing offense. The fathers knew of such freedom in human ceremonies. In the East, they kept Easter at another time than at Rome. When the Romans accused the Eastern Church of Schism, they were told by others that such practices do not need to be the same everywhere. Irenaeus says, diversity concerning fasting does not destroy the harmony of faith. Pope Gregory says that such diversity does not violate the unity of the church. In the Tripartite History, Book 9, many examples of different rites are gathered, and the following statement is made. It was not the mind of the apostles to enact rules concerning holy days, but to preach godliness and a holy life. All right, thus endeth the... Article 26 on the distinction of meats from the Augsburg Confession. Go ahead and give us your parting thoughts here, Pastor Squire. Yeah, so what the confessors are doing here at the end is summarizing not only with tangible examples, but again, that the Lutherans are a part of a conservative reformation. And that's not conservative politically, but they're getting rid of what is bad and they're keeping what is good. Traditions that lead to good order, that lead to self-control, that lead us back to Jesus. These are good things, but there is freedom in such things. They should not be required, and they should certainly not obscure the gospel by being preached as something that takes away sins. So whether it's when you celebrate Easter, whether it's when you fast, whether it's what kind of meat you eat, whether it's you eat meat at all, 
These things can be good and beneficial, but are not required, and they should be done in faith. That is to say, if your faith is in God, and that's right, then these things can follow. It's not the other way around. All right. So, and as we already pointed to earlier, this, while kind of a catch-all article, will be continued in some senses in the next article, which we'll take a look at next week, Article 27 on the Monastic Vows. Thank you for today to Pastor Mark Squire for joining us on Concord Matters and teaching us the Lutheran Confession of the Distinction of Meats from Article 26 of the Augsburg Confession. It's been a great pleasure having you join us again today, Pastor Squire. Well, thank you. It was great to be with you. And thank you also to KCMR Radio here in Mason City, Iowa, again, for allowing us to use their studio. We also want to thank our underwriter, Wicking Vicar. Check out their performance clerical wear at wickingvicar.com. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church. Church.